Welcome to Unleash Your Inner Goldilocks, How to Get It Just Right. Thank you for joining us for another hour of a wonderfully engaging and insightful conversation. Today, we are going to talk about the importance of unleashing a very special kind of energy. We all embody the masculine and feminine energy inside of us. They both have a equal place within us. But how do we unleash our full power? And how do we truly bring out the masculine characteristics of having goals and working our goals and celebrating success and driving that success without losing sight of our humanity, our kindness, our compassion, our ability to nurture ourselves and those around us and all our stakeholders. It's gonna take both of those for us to succeed in life and to build a harmonious and self-sustainable ecosystem as human beings for us to live. How do we do that? What are some of the tips and best practices for us to do that? And so much more is going to be discussed today. And I cannot wait for you to meet this very, very special lady, Dixie Gillespie. Dixie, welcome to Unleash Your Inner Goldilocks. Thank you so much. I've been looking forward to this conversation. I'm so glad this was the topic that you wanted to share on. Thank you. You are an author, you're a consultant, you're a coach, and you have mastered the art of not only for yourself, unleashing your firepower, helping others find that inner fire and unleash it so that they can rise up and live their dream. What brought you to a point of realizing there is a firepower beyond the things we do and the things we do as part of our career as we grow, because sometimes we tend to get mindless like a hamster on a wheel. I love that visual and it, it's so true. You know, we learn in contrast. And so honestly, what made me realize that was realizing that the fire had kind of, well, almost gone out. So I had been doing consulting for about eight years at that time. And you know, as, as your career grows, I don't know that I was quite the hamster on a wheel, but I was definitely on the, if there's an opportunity, you must take it. You need to love what you do because you're good at it and you're being rewarded for it. And I actually was at a funeral. Uh, my my brother-in-law passed unexpectedly at 52 and I was sitting at his funeral and everyone who gave a eulogy, and there were many that, that stood up to, to speak about Steve, everyone said Steve was so passionate. Steve was passionate about this. Steve was passionate about that. And just, and the song that his children chose, maybe a little unconventional for a funeral, but perfect for Steve was the flaming lips, what is the light? And so I'm listening to everyone talk about how passionate Steve was, which was so true. And listening to this song asking, what is the light? And I realized that while I'm a very passionate person and a very expressively passionate person by nature, my light, I really couldn't answer not only what is the light, but where was it? You know, it, it was kind of like that inner flame had burned down to a little tiny match. And I wasn't going to continue living that way as soon as I became aware of it. You know, I really believe noticing is the superpower because once you notice it, you have to make a conscious choice. You can no longer just make an unconscious choice. If you go back to default, you do it consciously. And I wasn't going to go back to that. And so I consciously began to understand what, what is that firepower? What is that inner light? What, what is it that keeps us really burning bright and whether or not I've mastered it, you know, the thing I love about your, your, your comment that I've mastered it is that it's about unleashing, you know, William White Cloud says being a magician isn't about never uh, having a day that isn't magical. It's about knowing how to return to your power as a mag magician. And the same is true for living, you know, really lit up on fire in your, in your, in your power and having firepower is that 
if I let it get leashed by anything or anyone, it's the knowing how to unleash it again. Brilliant, brilliantly explained, Dixie. And maybe there is this belief that mastery means I know everything, but mastery is knowing how to continuously learn and grow because the world around us is constantly changing. Frame of reference is altering. Reality is changing. Remember, we always talk in business, the only constant in life is change, right? So as the change happens, mastery is about, can I keep moving forward in my light, in my energy, and truly bringing my energy to bear so that regardless of what happens in the environment, I still bubble up to where I need to be. And I live embracing all of my energy and shining bright and be able to light up others, right? So that's my visual. My visual of energy is very much like when you're in church, a temple, all cultures have this. We all have a candle and one person's candle is lit and you turn around and light the next person's, right? That is the power of energy. I How? love, your, your language is so expressive and I love that feeling of it bubbling up. That's just, uh, that's just uh, the visuals that you're sharing are just, they're, they're beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. So what allows you to keep that flame going and bright as ever and feeding that flame so that you don't lose your light? Because you know, too many people get tired and give up. Yeah. Well, yeah, the, we get into the, um, yeah, you know, the, the, the title of the movie comes to mind, this is as good as it gets, or the where I was that, you know, this is so good, I should just be grateful. And we have this idea that being grateful means being content, and being satisfied with what is and not not reaching for anything more. And the, the beautiful thing is that, you know, like you said, not only is change the constant, everything is infinite. You know, when you start to just understand that energy is infinite, opportunities, possibilities, growth, it's infinite. So you're right. There's no mastery that is the, I have reached the peak. Mm -hmm. You know, the mastery is always, I've reached a new understanding. So a lot of this comes down to how the work that I've done with identity and the way that I, mm, the working definition I have, let's say, for my identity, not, not something that the experts are probably going to agree with, but it works for me. And it works for me to help clients through this lens that our identity is simply my current understanding, experience, and expression of my true self. Knowing that my true self is infinite and that in a limited experience that I've chosen, I'm in a body for a purpose. And that means I've chosen to have a limited experience. I'm not going to understand myself fully as my true self, because in a limited experience, you don't truly grasp in the infinite, right? But I can understand that it is infinite. I can understand, for instance, that, you know, it's like a kaleidoscope that has infinity in it. And every time I turn the kaleidoscope, I get a new expression of it, right? Get a new arrangement of what was already there. Mm -hmm. And so when I, when I use that working definition, to say, well, right now I understand myself as this. Therefore, I'm experiencing myself through the lens of my understanding and I'm expressing myself the way I experience myself, right? If we just say that's identity, when we start to expand that sense of identity to understand, for instance, that I, I may have been born into the world feminine, I may have been, you know, chosen to express myself that way, I may be in most respects, what the world would see my expression is feminine. But in my infinite true nature, I am also masculine. And believe me, if you've been through a, the path a lot of us have been on in business, we've had to be masculine. We've had to rock that masculine energy and get things done out there in the world. And you know, to, to stand in a competitive stance. So 
you know, it's, it's, I, I like to say I was born in the man box, which is kind of silly when you understand just how, how much of a girl I was. But at the same time, my father absolutely expected me to step in for the boy that he probably wishes he had. I came along late. So my parents, my, my dad was almost 43. Mom was almost 40. A boy would have been great because we lived in the country and had, you know, farm animals and a lot of land to take care of. You know, that masculine energy would have would have been helpful. And uh, dad didn't let the fact that I showed up as a girl stop him from being very demanding. But he also really demanded that I have that stoicism that you you think of as in the masculine. You know, he really demanded that I uh, that I have that kind of do or die attitude that you find in the masculine. So fortunately for me, honestly, um, you know, I use a lot of masculine energy very young. I also use a lot of feminine energy very young. And uh, that has really helped. You know, that has served me very well in learning to express the full range of my true, my true self. I love what I'm hearing. A few things that resonate for me and I know is going to resonate for our international audience is that how young of an age you realized that you embody both the masculine and the feminine energy. I am from the East, born and raised in Sri Lanka and grew up in South Asia. And just like you said, you were physically born into a female body. We believe that, you know, the energy of the universe is part masculine, part feminine. And the masculine energy is depicted as the dancing Shiva to symbolize the movement of atom. And the feminine energy is called Shakti, that literally means energy. And the union of atom and energy is what creates the universe. And from that energy comes each of our souls. So our soul contains the masculine and feminine energy, the ability to move and make things happen, which is the masculine side and the quiet, calm energy that holds everything together and nurtures and brings life to bear. That's the feminine energy. So you are able to bring that Eastern and Western philosophy in your explanation there. So I know it's gonna resonate for our audience. Brilliant. Beautiful. Well, it's, it's, tr it's true. You know, the true self that, mm -hmm. that I reference, I experience a soul. And I always tell, you know, clients, audience, it doesn't matter to me how you experience it. It's that you experience it, that you have an experience of yourself as inseparable mm -hmm. from all that is divine. And, you know, everything is, <laughs> yes. uh, you know, that you have that experience of yourself, whether you call it soul or not. For me, that's how I experience soul. That's my true self. You know, part of it's embodied. Here, that's a dis that's a choice, um, and part of it isn't. And if we experience ourselves only through the lens of, I you know my body is me, mm -hmm. well then I suppose I would be female. But I don't experience myself through my body is me. My body is something that I created, and chose to come into, in order to have a human experience, mm -hmm. in order to create in the in this material world in this plane, but it's not me. It doesn't define me. It doesn't confine me. And, uh, you know, it's really funny that you, that you mentioned Eastern philosophy. I, I did not get the door closed. So we will be, That's we will okay. be joined by, <laughs> by Orion. <laughs> Orion actually is part of most of my coaching sessions. He, uh, he's elected to be my, my co-coach and, okay. uh, usually shows up when, when I'm coaching or doing recodes. Uh, but I usually shut him out. No worries. How he managed to get the door open. But but the, the beautiful thing, you know, you, you mentioned, uh, I was actually in India when this conversation took place, but I know a lot of cultures and a lot of men have the same, um, the same structure of thinking. We we're talking about higher education. And this gentleman said to me, and we, we were talking through the lens of soul. This gentleman said to me, well, you know, I understand that everyone is masculine and feminine. And I think it's great for uh, women to be teachers at lower levels of education. Once you get into university, I think the instructors, the teachers should be men. They're, they're better prepared. And I said, 
But don't you think that that is a soul choice? He said, well, I think we, that we have a soul calling to be, to be teachers. And I said, but souls don't have a gender. Yes. Okay. That put an end to the conversation, I'm afraid, but I hope it gave him something to think about because it is true. You know, we, I, I, my experience with my own soul is that I chose certain experiences and certain creations while I was still in divine understanding. And we choose things from divine understanding that we would not choose from human understanding, right? Mm -hmm. You know, people say about my childhood, which included, you know, abuse of pretty much every nature you can imagine. You didn't choose that. And I say to them, but I think I did. You know, I think that before my soul came into a body, while I was still in an understanding of myself as indivisible from the divine, I think I probably looked at that and said, well, wouldn't that lifetime give you some power, some tools, some opportunities to create some change that you want to create in the world? And it's easy to say yes to something when you know that everything that happens in the limited plane is an illusion, mm -hmm. right? In your human understanding, you'd never say yes to some of the things that all of us have experienced. You know, I tell people the saddest thing about my story is that it is so not unique or unusual. Um, a human would never say yes to that. So I agree, the human me did not choose it. But when I'm in conversation with my soul, I feel that I did choose it. And I don't regret it. Mm -hmm. So that resonates for me totally coming from the world of karma. And the divine within me is the real me. This body is just a container, right? The soul is like water. And the body is just the bottle or the cup or the glass wherever that energy is contained. So we're living in an era where the masculine created business world has been in a direct collision course with a little virus called COVID. And that little virus has upended everything and made the human experience realize that masculine movement and results and outcome and success are empty in the long run. We need the layering of the feminine energy and kindness and compassion and grace and holding space for each other. They are very important in leadership. Leadership is not just military-like because we're all feeling creatures who are thinking and functioning, and we need to bring that emotional intelligence forward. So this is a great time for what you do and how you help organizations transform. What are you experiencing? What are you seeing out there in the world? Well, very much as you said, I mean, you, you really put so much of it in a nutshell right there and beautifully, beautifully done as well, that we have, centuries really um, go back as far as you like. And the centers of power in the majority of what we would call civilization has been held in the masculine. There might have been women who wielded it, but it was held in the masculine. It was held in being able to compete and conquer. It was held in being able to prove in the material sense. And that that physical strength, physical power is how we define power, but that isn't power, that is force. Mm -hmm. And so we have defined power as the ability to force and leadership has embodied that model as well. If I were a leader and I had a title, I was able to force people to do their jobs. And that was in fact my job to force people to do their job. We realized through COVID you can't force people to do their job in the middle of something like that because suddenly people realize my job isn't worth my life. My job isn't worth my mental health. They could no longer be forced. The power shifted as it needed to do. And I think, you know, very much like a lot of our experiences, we could say, gee, I wish there'd have been a gentler way to create that shift, but it needed to shift. And what I've seen happen 
is that even those people that before were the fearless leaders who were always working, you know, all the hours and pushing everybody else to do the same, who in fact use their own sacrifice to demand higher sacrifice from everyone else, they crashed. They crashed. They were brought face to face with their own humanity. And humanity is, as we've said, at its core, not masculine or feminine, but both. And it created a softness. I really saw it as, you know, the plane of our, our business culture was a very hard, harsh place. And in fact, we rewarded people who could navigate this really harsh landscape, right? COVID required that we have soft spaces in it. And it started to open people to the idea that softness can be more effective, efficient, productive, and profitable than the hard spaces that we had insisted had to be how business was defined. And it's been a beautiful and painful thing to watch, as transformation always is. You know, I, people talk about transformation as though it should be like this upward climb. You're always ascending to the top of the mountain. And I'm like, no, that's not, that's not transformation. That is aspiration. Transformation comes so that you can climb the mountain, yeah. right? But the models we have for transformation are, I mean, the two that I, that I think of the most often, of course, are the caterpillar to the butterfly and the phoenix to the new firebird. And both of those, you think about it in the middle, is a complete deconstruction of what was, mm -hmm. right? That's how alchemy works. It's a deconstruction of the elements that were into a nothing and no, it's no, it's a no thing. <laughs> it's a yeah. nothing into a new something that you've chosen. And in that no thing, we're really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, we're in that, the caterpillars in the goo, you know, in the chrysalis yeah. or the, the phoenix throws itself on the pyre and is consumed. Whatever, whatever model you want to think about, this transformation that we're going through into, I hope, if we stick with the process of transformation and understanding that to be whole, complete, and to aspire and attain what we really want to attain, that we need to have this transformation and, and become a new something, right? But mm -hmm. we're still very much in the goo or the fire or the, the messy middle, as I call it with clients, you know, the messy middle, there's a lot of, I don't know what it is. And yeah. in that space, the feminine is essential because it's the feminine that is designed to hold the thing that will be and isn't yet. I mean, think about the feminine body. We hold the thing that is the seeds there. It knows exactly what it's going to be. It's doing exactly what it needs to do, but it is not yet recognizable as the thing in the material world. That's exactly where we are. We're, we're in a very, very feminine space right now. And it's so important for us to not just continue the conversation, but have a roadmap on how to do this transformation. And as you're des describing, the word that comes to my mind is creative destruction. Creatively destroy what is so that we can emerge into something we were meant to become, right? And every, so, as you said, every religion has a divine model for that. Mm -hmm. And, and it's not because the religions got it right so much as it's inherent in creation at any level, creation in the mind, the mental creation and the physical you know, material plane that is inherent. And so we created religious models to represent it, but it's just truth. Mm -hmm. It is the universal truth. So before I open this up for one question from the audience, because We've been having this amazing conversation. How can the audience get a hold of you if they want to get in touch with you? Yeah, so there are several ways to get in touch with me. As you know, I use I use LinkedIn, so you're you're more than welcome to connect. Message um, the easiest way to to read more about this um, is to find the TEDx talk um, and on, on masculine and feminine energy. 
or to connect with me on my website at dixiegillespie.com. Beautiful. Thank you so very much, Dixie. I would like to open this up for any questions. Robin, Karen, go ahead. Thanks, Dr. Cass. Um, I have one quick question, Dixie. I know you recently um, published a new book and um, I've started reading it. I'm not finished yet, but I've started reading it. Um, and I'd really love to know how you feel that that book brings insight into the conversation that you've just been having about the masculine and feminine. Uh, you know, and thank you for reading it and for supporting it, Karen. It's just, it means so much. Um, the truth about winter, if you people ask me how Just Blow It Up, which was the, the book that was really for entrepreneurs and the truth about winter, which is an allegorical, you know, uh, almost parable type story of my mm -hmm. own process through abuse. Like, what do they have in common? And so asking this third question, what does that have in common with the work of being whole in ourselves and, and bringing, you know, both the energies into the world? And it still comes down to the same answer. The thing that that lights me up the most is when someone says, this is what I really want. Like, this is what I feel like my soul wants me to create. And the next thing they say is, but I can't because like it almost always follows. And sometimes like in the same sentence, and sometimes there's a breath in between what I really want, what I really want to do, what I really want to have, what I really want to be in the world, but I can't because, and so much of that can't because honestly, because we're trying to play by the old rules and the old rules say that your gender, the way that you identify in the world, the way you express yourself in the world, how you were born into the world, defines and confines what you can and can't do and what you will and won't be good at. And it's one of the things that I, I remember very early. Of course, I grew up in uh, what is basically a Christian cult. You know, we met in homes, not in a, a church. People really didn't know what this religion was, but it was very strict about what boys were supposed to do and what girls were supposed to do and what we couldn't do. And there was an awful lot as a girl, I couldn't do. I couldn't cut my hair. I just did. You probably noticed I took about five inches off of it. Um, just recently, I couldn't wear jewelry. I couldn't wear makeup. I couldn't wear pants. A very active girl growing up in a farm situation. I could not wear pants. There was so much about my gender presentation that defined how I had to show up in the world. And I think that more than anything else is this, when we embody our full self and we, we express that, experience ourselves as whole, complete, masculine, feminine energy, then we, then we just get to choose. Then it's just, what's your true choice? What do you want to do? What do you want to create in the world? You know, what do you want to be? You want to be an astronaut? Cool beans, go for it. Let's do it, right? It takes those shackles off, not just in the social structure, but in our personal structure. And that's, that's really what all three books are about, because, you know, the truth about winter, so much I thought I couldn't express and couldn't do because I'd had these experiences. You know, I, I'd had, I'd experienced physical sexual abuse from a very young age. And there's so much that I didn't even think would ever be open to me because of my experiences. And now I'm like, there's more open to me because not just of my experiences, but because how I've navigated those experiences, there's more available to me than there would have been had I had the easiest childhood imaginable. Yeah, totally. And to totally can relate to that. And I, you know, totally can relate to um, tapping into my masculine energy very, very young. Um, you know, from my experience, mostly because I, my perception as a child was that my father had all the power in the house. So therefore, in order to have power, you needed to be more masculine. So I was a quintessential tomboy for all, <laughs> for, for actually most of my life. It really wasn't until later that I could truly really embrace the feminine side. So, I mean, I think a lot of women, to your point in business, get stuck in that having to be in the masculine mode and um you know it is so freeing to be able to 
express both and embrace both. So thank you for the work that you're doing. Well, thank you for that beautiful question. It was, it was a beautiful thing for me to think through and to realize, yep, this is just part of that whole, that whole umbrella. And, you know, you talk about things you think you can't do as a very, very young child. I already knew I was not going to have children. And I'll tell you how all that connected in my head. In my understanding, it wasn't just the men who had all the power. It was the husband and father in the household. So I figured the only way for me to have power and autonomy in the world was to not get married. And if I wasn't going to get married, I wasn't going to have children. So people would ask me if I wanted to have babies someday as because they knew I loved babies. I babysat babies. Yeah. I loved infants. I would say, no, I'm not having kids. And people would be shocked because, of course, you weren't really a natural female if you didn't want children. And I never bothered to tell them it's not that I don't want children. It's see, I'm not going to give up my power to a yeah. man because I'm married to him and I'm not going to have kids unless I'm married to a man. So see how I'm not going to have, I never explained my thought process, <laughs> but, there was, but there was a thought process and an assumption behind that, that became part of my identity. Thank you so much for that insightful question and bringing out that additional layer of the book and connecting the dots, Karen. And Dixie, this has been such an honor and a pleasure to have this conversation. We definitely should get back together and continue this conversation and build on it. So let's have that planning outside of here. But as I bring this to a close, first, I'm so grateful to our audience and our guests for making these conversations and then translating these conversations into lived experiences. Ultimately, the whole purpose of unleashing our inner Goldilocks is to truly understand that success of our life is in the way we flow like water. Water is such a beautiful thing. It continuously flows without making any waves, but over time it can turn a mountain into a hill, into a rock, into a pebble, into a sand. And that is the power of truly flowing energy. And when that energy flows, we understand the true power of our humanity comes from our ability to influence. And the essence of Goldilocks is understanding that we can each only influence three levels from where we are. How do we find that centeredness where we balance our masculinity and femininity, where we balance our ability to show up not too hot, not too soft, right? Not too hot, not too cold. And in that centeredness is our ability to influence three levels to our right, three levels to our left and everybody in the center. So research proves that centeredness and freely flowing and being malleable is the essence of success. It's the essence of success in the way energy fluidly flows. And as we bring this to a close, I want each of you to take a moment and do an introspective analysis on what are you going to do to flow? What are you going to let do to let your energy find that centeredness for you so that the universal potential opens up for you and the divine within you has an opportunity to surface and thrive? Thank you.